great to be here. Thank you for that very warm welcome. I was saying that um, it is a special honor to be at the School of Social Work. Thank you, Don. Um, because my community are all social workers. Now, I became a lawyer, though, because I wasn't so good as a social worker. So bless me, sisters and brothers, for I did, I did sin or fail or not measure up because I was too impatient to be a social worker. I kept wanting to get things organized and get stuff on the road. And I discovered in law a perfect um, me meshing of two gifts and talents, the social work background for my community, and then the legal get it done. So I ended up practicing family law using quite a bit of my social work background trying to help family systems. Those of you that are into systems work might know about that. Family systems be better at the end of a divorce or other family law action. So I felt like I found a way to do social work uh, while doing something that felt way faster for, for me. So thank you for letting me um, come home in a way to social work. Uh, several of my sisters emailed me today. They said, Simone, I can't believe you're doing this. <laughs> and I said, oh, well, I hope they believe I'm doing this. So hopefully it'll all work out. Um, I, I need a little bit of help to get started because I'm curious as to how many of you watched the presidential debate last night? Okay, how many of you couldn't sleep after you watched the presidential debate last night? <laughs> A few of us, okay, some of us. Um, last night, for me, for those of you that didn't see the debate, it highlighted the real concern that I have for what's happening right now in our nation, where the issues before us the grave concerns of our time cannot be engaged in real conversation for a variety of reasons. Partially, I think uh, Secretary Clinton is extremely bright, extremely engaged in the details, but so intelligent that she quickly goes to specifics. And Mr. Trump has a tendency just to be about himself, it seems. And that combination means that there isn't a vision presented in the process. And what I think is coming down to we the people is that we the people become the place where the vision needs to bubble up. So tonight what I want to do is talk a little bit about what are the holes and tears in the fabric of our society, and then look at where there may be some reweaving, signs of hope, seeds for the future. So as I've said, my community, the Sisters of Social Service, are a social work community. My sisters in Budapest, were founded in Budapest, Hungary in 1923, and in Los Angeles in 1926. And in Budapest, in uh, 1924, they founded the first school of social work. And our foundress, Margaret Schlachta, was the first woman in the Hungarian parliament when she was the head of our community. So we've always had politics in our bones. And Margaret had this theory of social work that I want to share with you. It is this pyramid. And she said uh, that this pyramid had four layers. Okay, you got the picture? You have to three-dimensional pyramid. The bottom layer is the broadest layer, the anchor for society, is uh, what we would call direct service. One-on-one uh, -on -one engagement, it the, could be the therapeutic relationship, could be a service relationship, but it's one-on-one. -on -one. The second level in the pyramid is group work, what we used to call group work. I don't know what you call it these days, but eh, where you work with groups in the community uh, for their own development and growth. The third level is movement work. 
And then the fourth level, and probably because she was in the legislature, she maintained that the very top of the pyramid was legislative work. And that social work was about having these four layers in communication with each other. And that legislation was better if it was connected with direct service, group work, movement work. And each one of those levels was better if connected with legislation. What I've realized is the kind of work that we do at Network really uh, lives out her theory. Because what we do at Network is we work at the legislative level, but then we get to go around the country and meet fabulous people and hear amazing stories and work at the direct service group work and movement work. And that informs our legislation and I pray that our work then informs that direct service. So I want to talk to you about some of the things that we have seen in our travels on the bus. Because one of the things that I know is that we need to know what's happening around us. And in the direct service, one-on-one -on -one engagement, I want to tell you the story of Jeannie and Lynn who came to our first, uh, on our first bus trip in Cincinnati. They brought me their, the picture of Jeannie's sister, Margaret. And they came direct from Margaret's memorial service. Margaret had died because she lost her job in the recession in 2009. When she lost her job, she lost her health care. When she lost her health care, she couldn't get screened for colon cancer, even though she knew she had a genetic predisposition predisposition for it in their family. And then in 2012, she ended up dying of colon cancer. The family didn't know how sick she was until it was almost the, the end. She finally got carried into an emergency hospital and they said she was terminally ill, that there was no hope. And Margaret died at the age of 56 because she didn't have health care. She died because the Affordable Care Act wasn't fully implemented. Now the real worry here in, in Missouri is that Missouri has not expanded Medicaid to cover people like Margaret. And so while we can talk about the direct service to Margaret, that she as an individual should have had health care, should have had someone with her, for me, that's a pro-life issue. The fact is, law still here in Missouri is denying Margaret's in similar positions access to health care. So you see the connection between a policy, a legislation, and the individual service. Now, hold on to Margaret in your mind, uh, because she's going to come back towards the end of my, end of my talk. I also met, um, and, and actually I just got a text from one of our sisters that was on the bus. We met this woman, Angie, in Jefferson City. Jeff City, which is the capital of Missouri. Okay, but you have to tell me, is this the side of the state that says Missouri or Missouri? Missouri. Missouri. Okay. Phew. All right. I was in Kansas City last week, and so I, I knew it was one way or the other, and I didn't know which way. Okay, Missouri. Um, but we met Angie in Jeff City. And Angie had moved from St. Louis to Jefferson City because she wanted a better, safer place. But when she got there, she discovered that she, the only thing she could afford was basically the housing project. And she had found with CAP services, Community Action Program services, some in-home supportive services for her that with her disability, she was able to hold down a part-time job. And then her part-time job was, uh, her hours were moved to the evening. It was then that she discovered that the Jefferson City public transit bus system works from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. 
and her job had just been changed from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. out in the suburbs. She tried walking home after her shift, which she said wasn't too bad in the summertime, but then the winter came and it was dark and cold and snowing. And so she begged her employer for some extra hours so that she could have enough money to be able to pay a taxi to get home. Because her minimum wage job was not sufficient to be able to afford both food and a taxi. Angie struggles hard. Angie is trying to care for the kids in her neighborhood. She considers them all her kids. She probably would make a great social worker because she calls up the mayor and gives him what for and lets him know when things aren't measuring up. And she has the chief of police on speed dial when his people are harassing the kids in the neighborhood. Good social work activity. But what she said was that she feels really alone because she's working so hard and other people are afraid to step up. One-on-one -on -one helps her, but it's not enough. So that bottom pillar or the bottom foundation is direct service, one-on-one. -on -one. Group work, let me give you two stories about group work. Group work is that working with folks, I don't know what do you call it these days, but because you've got micro and macro and clinical and all these other names for it, but it's the working in a group setting to help a group make a difference. And we were on the bus this summer and we uh, went to Midtown here in St. Louis and there's Voices of Women. Do any of you know of Voices of Women down there? Okay, some of you do. Good. Um, so you know I'm, I'm telling the truth about this. And Miss Bobby was telling us about the work that these amazing women were doing. Now the ones we met were senior citizens in the African American community. And these women have organized a um, micro lending project. They have worked together to improve their situation for their families. They have uh, started urban farming. One of the women who I got to talk to left our press, our rally so that she could get, go home and get the pictures of the cabbages that she had been growing in her backyard in these raised beds that they had gotten the teenagers in the neighborhood to make for them. Because she said, I'm too old to step down to the ground. I can't bend over that far. But with the raised beds, then they could do the farming. And these women, voices of women, were taking the fresh produce out to the communities where they're food deserts. And Washington University had given them this lime green trailer where they could use it like their little store and take it around. It was fabulous. But it is a group working together to make a difference in their community. Seeds of hope in central St. Louis. Then I want to tell you about a group up in uh, Toledo, Ohio. Um, we were at St. Anthony of Padua Center up in Toledo, Ohio. And Sister Jenny there and several staff have created a variety of group programs there to help the neighborhood come together and build community and make a difference. And one of those programs is a program for kids that have been suspended from school. And I met Matt and Mark, these two twins, cutie pies. You could see how they had that impish look in their eye. But Matt, as twins often do, Matt held all the emotion for the couple, for the two of them, for the twins. They were 10 years old. But you could look at Matt and he kind of got a quivering lip and he looked a little nervous and he was in the spotlight and he was kind of scared. And then Mark. Mark came swaggering up, held out his hand and shook my hand and you could tell he navigated the world. 
So I found out why they were in this program for kids that had been suspended. They were in this program because they'd been fighting at school. Hmm. Well, what had happened was a kid was picking on Matt, pretty bullying Matt, apparently. So Mark, ever engaged in dealing with business, slugged the kid. And the kid slugged Mark back. But to everyone's surprise, Matt then slugged the kid. So all three of them end up getting suspended. Now, I don't know about that as good educational policy, but that's what happened. But what happened then for the boys is for Matt and Mark, uh, Sister Virginia at the Plattawa Center had created this program for kids suspended from school where they can work together and um, create community and get support and work on their issues and lear keep learning. Well, what happened when they did a home visit at Matt and Mark's home is they found out these 10-year-old boys had been the sole caretaker of their bedridden mother who was bedridden with multiple sclerosis and her diabetes was out of control. The kids were trying to cook in the microwave healthy food for her, but they were the ones that were taking care of the world for her. And what Sister Virginia was able to do with the other resources was to get help for the mom, but get the kids into a group situation where they could be kids again and not have to worry, where they could work on their own developmental issues. Well, Mark asked me if, he, if I wanted to see where they worked, and I said yes. And he ran up these three, well, it was up on the third story of a 102-year-old rectory, and he was a lot faster than I was, but praise God, I'd been keeping up with my steps. So I could keep up, I could keep up with him. And we got up to the third floor and he showed me where the computers were, but he couldn't turn them on because Mr. T wasn't there. And I thought, wow, that's pretty good for a 10-year-old kid. What discipline. And then he showed me his work and the work they were doing together and how they were learning about the community. And then he says to me, this 10-year-old says to me, do you want to see something pretty? Well, what are you going to say? Of course I want to see something pretty. What does a 10-year-old think is pretty? And he walks over, he throws open this door and flips on a light. And it's a bathroom, but it's recently redone. And there's tiles on the wall, and the light glistens off the tile. And each tile has a fern, a blue fern pattern in it. And it, he looks at it, and he says, isn't it beautiful? And then he reaches out his finger, and he runs it over the tile, because there's a little a beveled place where the fern sticks up and he says, you can touch it if you want to. Well, how could I not? But what I realized was that Matt and Mark, because of the work of this group, were beginning to be able to see beauty, to relax enough to even know that beauty was around them, to have a setting where they could celebrate beauty and he wanted to share it. That's what group work is about, but that is where the seeds of hope get planted, is in the capacity to make a difference and see hope. Then there's movements. Movements like Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter is a key movement for our time. Because because it is an, a movement organically created that comes forward with leadership that claims an important space in our society. Black lives do matter, but too often in our society where there is the white dominance, white privilege, is that black lives often get squelched in the process, both internally and externally by the messages that are communicated. So a movement rises up from the needs of the community 
and moves forward. We are in dire need of Black Lives Matters. We're in dire need of more movements where, peop where organically it comes together and some leadership emerges. Let me tell you about one organic movement that we saw up in, oh, it wasn't Toledo also, but it was this year on the bus. We saw a group called Flock. Farm Labor Organizing, and I forget what the CK stands for, but it's Flock. But what they have done is gotten the teenagers together, so they're teen flocks. <laughs> Teen flocks are working together to make a difference in their high school community. And they're creating a movement by learning organizing principles. These young people, I, I, I was so amazed at the young women. The young women came together in a girls group and uh, they're juniors in high school and they engaged the school leadership, the school board, on the issue of sexual harassment in their high school. They engaged and got the school board to agree to accept a grant, which the school board had been rejecting, to hire a counselor for sexual harassment, to put up in the girls' restrooms numbers that the girls can call with confidence and, and with the guarantee of uh, privacy and protection and they also got the school board to agree to reorganize the school manual or the uh, personnel manual so it was no longer just about bullying, but it was clearly about sexual harassment. The girls were amazing. And they were so delighted at their leadership and pretty surprised that they could accomplish it. But that's the glory of a movement that you can accomplish something together when you organize and make something happen. The boys, not to be outdone by the girls, were busy organizing not only this, principally the Hispanic community, but the Hispanic community, the teens, had reached out to the African American teens and together they were engaging the police to create new protocols for police engagement, trying to protect everyone in their high school. Isn't that great? They were engaged in proactive making a difference because they saw the need. And so then you trickle up to legislation. Now I work in legislation in DC and it's rare that we can claim a big victory. We have little victories, like today we stopped a bad bill from moving forward. So we celebrate that, but to explain it is really complicated because it was a cloture vote and it was this, and this committee and that committee and politics and it would be too boring to try to tell you in detail, but we had a little success. But legislation really is the long, hard slog of trying to institutionalize the little gains that we have made. Often, our programs need funding from government, from federal sources. That's often the way we inter interact. But what we know is that they get challenged by the political divisions of our time. Political pardon partisanship is tearing the heart out of who we are. It is a huge, huge challenge to try to get something to happen. So when Margaret died without health care, Margaret's death became the fuel for my passion to make sure Medicaid is fully implemented in all the states, including Missouri. Missouri needs to do this. Our people are dying, and you know what else is happening? The rest of the health system is suffering because of the fact that so many people have, are uninsured and have no access. We're hurting ourselves, it is ridiculous. Not that I have any feeling on the subject, but. But what we know 
is that Medi expanding Medicaid works. We've got to move beyond the political partisanship to make a difference. And this is where I think one of the most challenging political messages of this election cycle needs to be countered. Many people say, oh, we need a businessman or woman to, you know, to run the government. We need somebody who's good at business. I would like to say that I think business is very different from government. Business, <laughs> business is about individual profit. It's about making money. It's about my success. We did uh, these business, 13 business roundtables last year, and uh, one uh, guy at a business roundtable said to me, oh, but Sister Simone, you know, the only thing we really care about is the bottom line, is making money. That's why we're in this. And we got to make enough to pay our bills, yeah, but I want to make a profit. That's what we're in about. That's a very narrow focus where you can keep an eye on the bottom line day by day if you want to. Whereas government, government is, pull, is um, organized around the Constitution. And remember what the first three words of the Constitution are? It's we the people. It's not profit for me. It's we the people. It's all of us together, so that the instinct for government is about the common good, not about the private benefit, the private profit. And so I think we make a mistake when we think, oh, you can just take the obsession with profit and put it into an obsession for the common good. I don't think that works too well. It doesn't seem to be working too well. And so, yes, we can talk about efficiencies. Yes, we can talk about, you know, hard-nosed administrators. Yes, we can talk about making good choices. But the role of government, this legislative work, is about caring for the common good, where we all can be together. Now, it is that pyramid that we, the people, are trying to revive at this point. And I have to tell you that I find hope in many sectors. I find hope in Mark who can tell me something's beautiful or in Angie who works so hard and struggles so hard to get by in Jefferson City or movements like Black Lives Matter and Flock and others. But you know what the challenge is? The challenge is it feels so small, so small and not enough. Last fall, Pope Francis, just a year ago, was in the U.S. Do you remember that? And I got to be in the congressional chambers when he addressed Congress. Um, I had Barbara Box, Senator Barbara Boxer's ticket, and I was seated right next to Cindy McCain, Senator McCain's wife. And we had to be there an hour and a half early to go through security. And when I discovered who I was sitting by, I was thinking, oh my. An hour and a half, ooh, what are we gonna have to talk about, ooh. But do you know what happened? Is we had this amazing conversation about immigration reform and how Senator McCain had promised Senator Kennedy before he died that he would see immigration reform through to the end. And that's why he was running for re-election so he could keep his promise to Senator Kennedy. I was really touched by it. I was also really shocked we had such a pleasant conversation because I don't always agree with her husband in such a lovely fashion. But Pope Francis challenged Congress by talking about how the role that they play, the role that they play is to set a vision for the community, to lift up what we need, to be in fact the models for moving forward together as a society. And in the end he said, a nation can be considered great when it defends liberty as Lincoln did, when it fosters a culture which enables people to dream of full rights for all their brothers and sisters as Martin Luther King sought to do, when it strives for justice in the cause of the oppressed as Dorothy Day did by her tireless work. 
and the fruit of a faith which becomes dialogue and sows peace in the contemplative style of Thomas Merton. That is the vision Pope Francis set up for us. Now I have to tell you, Congress is a little far away from that vision. But for that one brief shining moment, there was this idea in Congress that yes, we could live up to that ideal. We're a year out. They haven't exactly lived up to that ideal recently. And I've come to realize that I think the genius of our nation is not about Congress and it's not about the executive branch, it's not about the judicial branch, though all three are important. It's about the fourth element that too often gets left out. The fourth element for me is we the people. It's all of us together. It's we the people that will make the difference. It's we the people that will fight for liberty. It's we the people that will hold the dreams. It's we the people that will be able to work tirelessly for those at the margins. And it's we the people that in that contemplative space can find unity where it seems impossible. So it's we the people. It's we the people we've been waiting for and here we are tonight. So I want to urge on you four basic virtues for the 21st century. Since I'm a Catholic sister, I can urge virtues on people. And even if you aren't exactly religious or you're sort of spiritual or you thought about religion once and gave up on it, these are virtues for everyone. The first virtue for the 21st century that I urge on you, especially social work students and graduates is please, please, please exercise often the virtue of joy. Too often those of us that care about this stuff, have you ever noticed this? Kind of become a little down, a little grim, a little serious. It's awful. We've done all these studies. We know all these facts. It's just awful, terrible. And then we say to our friends, I'm miserable. Please come join me. It's not exactly a great selling line, you know. But if we can exercise a bit of joy, it changes everything. It changes everything because in the midst of all the struggle, we see little signs of hope. Mark gives me such joy because he saw beauty as a young kid. Even Margaret gives me joy because I know of Jeannie and Lynn and their commitment to their sister. Black Lives Matter in the midst of all of the struggle around race that we're dealing with and white privilege. Black Lives Matter gives me hope and joy because of the engagement, the vibrant engagement of people. We need to see this movement, this moment as a time of joy. Not all the time, not every day. But if you're in community, the good news about being in community is every day somebody will be joyful. And then you can have your grumpy days too. But we all need to exercise joy. The second virtue for the 21st century that I would urge on you is holy curiosity. Holy curiosity, not just ordinary curiosity. Holy curiosity is where you want to know the stories of the people that you meet. You want to know what's behind what people are doing. You want to understand. We exercised holy curiosity on the bus this summer when we went to the Republican convention and the Democratic convention. And at, the, at both conventions we did this, but it was most fun at the Republican convention. We had red wagons that we pulled around and we couldn't get our bus downtown. So we had an outline or a, a, you know, a foam board with the design of the bus and it was on the side of the red wagon and we had these big igloo containers of lemonade. And we dragged the wagon around. It was really hot in Cleveland. And we gave out little cups of lemonade. And whoever would take a cup of lemonade, then we would engage them in conversation. Holy curiosity. Holy curiosity started with, hmm, who in your family is it difficult to talk to about politics and why? Well, it always got people going. Somebody, oh, why? There's somebody in everybody's family. And what I discovered at the Republican convention was probably they had trouble with the people I'd feel good about. And 
and they felt good about the people I'd have trouble with. And so it was a great conversation because we could, you know, share perspectives. The second question that we asked is, what worries you in this election cycle? And so many people told us in both conventions that they worried that there wasn't a good choice for a president. They didn't know, and so I'd say to them, what are you gonna do? Well, some of the Republicans said to me, well, lifelong Republican, I'm a delegate, I'll do what I must. And it sounded like a soldier with bad orders going into battle, but that's what they were doing. And then our third question for them was, what gives you hope for our nation? And at the Democratic Convention, people could quickly come up with hope. They had stories to tell or movements or things that gave them, you know, uplifted them. I, I'm sorry to say at the Republican Convention, there were some hopes, but more often than not, people would go, hope, uh, hope, uh, well, Hmm. And then finally, this one guy said to me, the Constitution? Like maybe there was a right answer and he was going to get it wrong. <laughs> and I realized that when you're so preoccupied with worry and fear, when you're so separate and individual, there's no room for hope. Hope can only grow when we're in connection with each other. When I know your story, you know mine, and I trust you have my back and I've got yours. Hope is at the heart of community. Individualism is fueled by fear and division and separateness. There's no hope there. Hope is when we are together, and so holy curiosity helps weave us together. Once you've exercised holy curiosity, then you have a responsibility for the third virtue, and that is sacred gossip. <laughs> Not ordinary gossip, sacred gossip, where you share the stories of what you found out, what people think. Like my, like my Republican guy who just felt like he had to do what he must do, or the one who couldn't think of a hope. But sacred gossip is where we share with concern the stories we know. Because that weaves us together, because then we know we're all connected. It's not that different from how I think of things. And then finally, the, third, the fourth virtue for the 21st century is the virtue of doing your part. Too often those of us that are in the social work line think we have to do it all. I've got it covered, I've got a plan, I'll take care of it, my answer, it'll do it all. No. Just do your part. Because in community, as long as we each do our part, it all gets done. Now in the scriptures, since we're at St. Louis U, I can talk about this. Um, uh, St. Paul in the epistle writes about, you might remember this, that he writes that we're all one body. He has this image that the community is one body. Well, that's it. If we're in community together, we all have a different part to play. That's why we are different. Because we don't play the same part. So I had this strange prayer life, so I prayed about what would be my part in the body of Christ. Well, what I came to realize is I think my role in the body of Christ is to be stomach acid. <laughs> I'm not a hand or a foot. I'm not doing direct service. I, I actually do some lobbying on legislation, but I'm not a highfalutin, high-paid lobbyist. I, I don't do the group work or I'm sort of about movements, but my role, I think, is to go around and stir up energy you know, help you digest what's happening in your life and in your world, trying to free up some energy so we can act together. But my question for you is, what is your part? Because I can only do my part, but I'm counting on you to do yours. And if we, the people, are going to be the place of hope for our future, we've got to be in this together. To weave it back together, it requires doing your part. Now let me tell you a weaving story about Margaret. 
In 2014, I got her picture in 2012. In 2014, I'm in Lexington, Kentucky, getting ready to give a talk, and a woman comes up, puts her hand on my shoulder, and she says, I'm Nancy, I'm one of Margaret Kistler's sisters. I just want to thank you for helping to heal my family. What? And she walked away. And I wasn't paying attention, I was like, what, what? You know how that happens? And so I ran after her, I grabbed her, I said, what, explain it to me. Well, it turns out Margaret had five siblings. I had just met Jeannie. And the five siblings were fighting with each other because they felt guilty that Margaret had died. And so one said, well, you're a nurse, you should have looked in on her. And well, you're closer, you should have looked in on her. Well, you've got money, you should have gotten her health insurance. They were all blaming each other. But what I discovered is, my speaking about Margaret and her, her senseless death gave meaning for her family to what was an otherwise senseless death for them and freed them of a bit of their guilt. And in that moment, I knew Margaret fueled my passion for Medicaid expansion, but my passion healed them so they didn't blame each other so much anymore. It's rare that we see how my part fits with your need and their gift fit with my need, but it all came together. See how that works? That's community. Occasionally we know how it goes. Occasionally we know how it fits together. But we've got a lot of work to do. We've got to let our hearts be broken open to everyone, because then we can leave no one out of our care. We the people is not an exclusive term. It's for all of us. And that's what we need to do. So to close, and then we're gonna open it up for some questions, comments. Let me close with, with my poem that's called Living Waters. And it is about that effort to do, be transformed, to know the hope, the possibility, the struggle that we all have. And quite frankly, change is tough. So this is my poem about that. It's called Living Waters. Impetuous me favors the passionate tumult of spring river flooding. Sensuous me favors the indolent caress of summer river flowing. Reflective me favors the penetrating seep of autumn river trickling. Even aloof shy me favors the chilled reserve of winter river freezing. But all of me resists evaporation. I resist the sucking, pulling warm air resting me from known boundaries. I resist drifting unseen to unknown parts. I resist the uncertainty of unformed floating, yearning rather to surround rocks and carve new paths. I resist the ambiguous foggy drift. But luckily, at times, I am yanked into air there, beholding Earth's anguish. Weep, weeping, raining, puddling, perhaps the beginning of an exuberant spring. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, this is my favorite part. So I, I said that I really like questions and answers. Mostly I like the conversation because I hear myself talk all the time. And so I always like to hear some other folks. But we can get started. Are, is there somebody bold who wants to start us with a comment? Okay, does Catholic equal anti-abortion? That's the question. Do you know in France, the French bishops, when the issue of legalizing abortion came up, the French bishops, decide, US, the French Catholic bishops, decided not to oppose the legalization of abortion because it was an issue that, of discrimination for them, for women in poverty. Because rich women could go to Switzerland or Sweden, but poor women were stuck. And so they decided not to oppose the legalization of abortion. 
France has much more liberal abortion laws than the U.S. does. But they have a much lower abortion rate because they provide supports for families, for women. Healthcare, what a radical thought. Um, Childcare, uh, paid time off. A woman who uh, has a child in France has a year's paid time off. Now, that, we were talking family-friendly workplaces in the car coming, I was with two young women, mothers, and, but that makes all the difference. Having economic supports makes the difference for women. Now, what's happened with abortion in our country, it's become the organizing principle on both sides, which just drives me nuts. Because it organized for the left on the pro-choice and on the right pro, called pro-life, which is really pro-birth. And so the, the piece that drives me nuts is nobody's really about solving the problem. They're about organizing their political basis. And so what I try to do is try to speak from that middle ground where it's about, let's take care of pregnant moms. Let's support life, let's support our families, let's make a difference. And that's why we at Network have uh, one of our seven policies to mend the gaps is a family-friendly workplace. Women need to be supported. And if we're a nation of family values, then we need to support our families. Now, granted, uh, I'm not exactly mainstream on that argument right now, but I'm hoping it'll catch on. And if we the people are really about making a difference, then we've got to stand up. And you have to be able to put up with a bunch of crummy stuff on Twitter, but hey, if that's all I have to do, all right. Oh, speaking of Twitter, follow me on Twitter. I'm only six people away from getting to 15,000. I'm really excited. So anyway, all right. I'm very competitive with myself, so follow me. All right, but the, good, good point. And, and that tears us apart, because then we can't come together and have conversation. We just yell at each other. Middle ground, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Marianne. You're great. <laughs> Sister Marianne Nestle is a former board member and doing her job still. I'm really grateful. Um, as the executive director, I sort of flunked that. Yes. Follow us at uh, networklobby.org. You can go on. We've got all these fabulous uh, under our election. Uh, if you go on to networklobby.org, you can see our under elections. We've got these side by sides comparing the uh, presidential candidates. And we've got little video clips of them too. So they're little videos, talks about. And then the, the ending part of each one is, well, now you decide who's best for our nation. Who will you vote for on November 8th? So there's a lot of good things up there. Uh, on Twitter, you can find me. It's SR underscored Simone. And Network Lobby is at Network Lobby. So you can follow us. And on Facebook, my folks are really great on Facebook. I'm terrible. They're fabulous, and a lot of people like to follow us on Facebook. One more? Okay. Oh, how has my life as a religious transformed me, hopefully, into being for and with others? Hmm. Well, I've been a Catholic sister forever, and I wasn't born in the convent, but it sort of feels like it. Uh, so, I mean, it really has shaped my adult life. But the deepest, most important thing, I think, for me, is my sister's support and encouragement of a daily contemplative prayer practice of meditation. And my meditation, you know, you, you sit without moving for 25 minutes of a time, and you breathe, and you're supposed to let go of everything. And most of mine is about fighting with God and yelling and telling God what ought to happen and how that really ought to be organized and wouldn't. But then on retreat a few years ago, I got pushed to realize that I needed to radically accept everyone. Now this is very annoying, and, um, but radical acceptance, what I came to realize was that if you don't, if I, I'd like to say you, but if I don't accept the other person, if I'm at odds with the God and the other person, I'm at odds with the God and me. How annoying is that? And so I realized I had this list in my head that I had sort of titled Mistake of God list. You know, God on an off day, a model not to be repeated, 
it was, uh, and most of them were politicians. And uh, I mean, okay, bless me sisters and brothers for I have sinned, but did you ever notice Mitch McConnell doesn't have lips? <laughs> and it really isn't nice of me to do that. But on retreat, I got forced into radical acceptance. It's called spiritual direction. I like spiritual drift better, but spiritual direction. And when I got to that place of radically accepting, I knew I had to hold them, the, my mistake of God list, in my heart with care as much as I hold my friends. So like Paul Ryan, who I, lo I lobby and annoy on a regular basis, I mean, I care about him. I've come to care. I've come to care about John Boehner and folks that I find difficult, but it's about holding them in care then frees me from my meaner self. And then the second thing, after I got to this holy place of accepting everybody, and I thought I'd have three more days of retreat being holy, um, my, spirit, my uh, retreat director said, okay, now add in fighting. Fighting? I just got to the holy place of accepting. What's wrong with this? Fighting? And he told me, go back, meditate. <laughs> Well, finally what I realized was that I really think that the gospel call is too often we get caught in fighting against, pushing back against. And so that's where we get, and we reinforce whatever it is we're fighting against. And the, the gospel call, this contemplative stance, is to rather fight for a vision. So if we fight for a vision, then I can say to Speaker Ryan, if you'll let me talk to him, he keeps saying he's not ready to talk to sister. So I, I don't know, someday he will. But then I can say to him, can we articulate the vision that we see? And if we can both articulate a shared vision, then we're halfway there to solving the problems that we have. And too often the politics, like on abortion, becomes this fighting against as opposed to fighting for a vision for families, or fighting for a vision where kids, 10-year-olds, are not taking care of their mother, or for fighting for a vision where everybody has access to health care. When we fight for a vision, then our hearts are free. And I don't get weighed down with my burden of thinking you're a mistake of God, or you're thinking I'm a mistake of God. That's what finally got me was when I realized Oh, if I think you're a mistake of God, you probably think the same thing about me. So I wanted to change that narrative. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Campbell, for your thoughtful, hopeful, and inspiring presentation.